understanding the way markets work can be difficult. Throw on nuanced approaches like decentralization and cryptocurrencies, and things can seem even more complicated. And while notions like digital black markets and non national currencies may have seemed futuristic only a few years ago, today, peer to peer anonymous exchanges like Bitcoin is allowing is pioneering an entirely new way for the global community to think about financial systems. Knowing how cutting edge Bitcoin is, yet having such little understanding how it actually works. I decided to speak to Andreas Antonopoulos, founder of Route 11 and co-host of Let's Talk Bitcoin. I first asked him to break down exactly how Bitcoin works and why it's so important to have a decentralized system of money. Bitcoin at first glance is uh, digital money, but if you look a bit deeper, you realize that that is just one of the applications enabled by an underlying network that allows a distributed system of computers to build a global asset ledger. So like a list of transactions for the entire world that shows who owns what Bitcoin when. And that's based on a really fundamental invention that allows computers to coordinate in that way without a central authority. And the thing is that central authorities and money traditionally are used as levers of power. Uh, either to inflate a currency and cause it to lose value, which is essentially a form of uh, confiscation or uh, hidden taxation, when your savings account depletes in its purchasing power uh, because the central government is printing money to finance its own activities. So, you know, the, the idea of a decentralized uh, currency is is important because it removes those levers of power that people can exploit to corrupt a currency. So in this global network, everything runs based on simple mathematical rules. A fixed number of coins are issued every 10 minutes, and that amount decreases over time so that eventually only 21 million bitcoins will be issued. And that creates a fixed monetary supply, uh, which has some interesting characteristics from an economic perspective. And all of this is done simply by consensus. It's impossible to cheat the system because uh, once you've done the work, it's, it's in your interest to actually get uh, the system reward rather than try to cheat the system. Can you elaborate on how centralized systems don't exist in nature? Sure. So uh, Bitcoin represents a decentralized system, and decentralized systems are usually the way nature organizes things. So in nature, you don't see hierarchical uh, systems very much. In fact, usually what you see is these loosely coupled decentralized systems that create emergence and complex behavior based on some very simple rules repeated by thousands of members. A perfect example of that is an ant colony like uh, the leafcutter ant, where individual members are extremely simple organisms. You can even simulate a single ant on a computer. But you put uh, several hundreds of thousands or even millions of ants together into a colony, and they exhibit incredibly complex behavior. The leafcutter ant, for example, uh, farms aphids as a farmed species, like a domesticated species, the way we farm cattle. Uh, and, and that's an incredibly complex and sophisticated behavior, but it doesn't exist in any of the individual members. It's something that emerges from the complex interaction of simple rules. Bitcoin is a system that exhibits extremely complex emergent behavior, but it's based on a few very simple rules that are followed by all of the members of the network. Someone who sits atop of a hierarchical system is CEO of JP Morgan Chase, Jamie Dimon. He recently denounced Bitcoin and predicted that it's going to fail. Right now, Bitcoin is still in the experimental phase, similar to what the internet was in the early 90s. What's your response to Diamond's prediction? It's very difficult for people who have lived their entire life in a hierarchical system, especially at the top of a hierarchical system, and gain the benefits uh, that come from that, including the ability to exhibit rent-seeking behaviors and to avoid prosecution for fraud that would put other people in jail a long time ago, and then be able to sit down and have a buddy-buddy conversation with the Secretary of Treasury without anyone blinking an eye. Um, when they sit down and discuss competitive technologies and chuckle about them. I don't think Jamie Dimon really understands Bitcoin, but that's not surprising. Um, it's not his role to understand the competing technologies, uh, because um, really he's in such a comfortable position whereby he can just receive $70 billion of free money from the Fed in the form of corporate welfare and, and doesn't have to compete. And you see this across the financial services industry where competition is stagnant, really. Uh, they compete on who can financialize a derivative to exploit uh, the market better or who can front run, app, um, front run sales 
and stock transactions on a high-frequency trading network. But in terms of consumer innovation, very little has happened in the last 50 years. Speaking of U.S. Treasury Secretary Jack Lew, recently he said that Bitcoin gives individuals a place to hide and could allow for the funding of terrorist activities. What's your response, especially in light of the two New York executives who were just charged with conspiracy to commit money laundering, excuse me, by selling over $1 million in Bitcoins to the black market website Silk Road? Well, Bitcoin actually uh, offers a scale of anonymity to full uh, disclosure of identity. On Bitcoin, it's actually harder to do uh, strong anonymity, whereas it's easier to do strong transparency. One of the things we've seen on the Bitcoin network is the ability for charities and other public responsibility organizations or publicly accountable organizations to operate an open set of accounts and open books where everyone can see exactly what's going on. So if you want, you can use Bitcoin to deliver extreme fairness and transparency. And so far, there doesn't seem to be any indication that law enforcement organizations have any trouble tracking down transactions on Bitcoin using old-fashioned police uh, activities. Uh, I think, in fact, uh, Bitcoin is far more transparent than our current financial system. If you ask, for example, um, economists, they have no idea what the full size of a hedge fund market is or what the full size of uh, leverage debt is, because no one knows. A lot of this happens on closed markets where there's no accountability. Well, the price of Bitcoin fluctuates day to day. Right now, one Bitcoin costs $776. How can this currency become accessible to someone who isn't willing to spend a small fortune on an unstable investment? So I think it's important to recognize that um, uh, one Bitcoin is not necessarily the unit you buy. Just like, for example, at the moment, it's probably about $45,000 to buy a bar of gold. Uh, no one goes out and buys a whole bar of gold when they want to invest in gold. What they buy is a fraction of it. And you can buy a fraction of a Bitcoin. You can buy as little as $10 on the market. Uh, I buy every week, and I often buy as little as 10 or $20 in order to increase my investment in Bitcoin. Uh, so it's very easy to enter the market, and one of the easiest ways is to use a site like localbitcoins.com to find someone in your area who is willing to sell you a small amount of Bitcoin for cash in a safe transaction um, with a full escrow capability so you can't get cheated in a public place, a park or a Starbucks, and you can buy some Bitcoin. Um, or you can take a product and service that you can offer and sell it to people for Bitcoin. That's also very easy to do. So the market is much more accessible than th people think, but a lot of the friction is really at the edges, and it's caused by the regulators who are stomping on all of the exchanges, not providing a lot of clarity in the regulation and making it very difficult for people to transact um, between currencies. Once you're in the Bitcoin system, things become surprisingly fast and fluid and easy to use. Uh, and so that actually ends up revealing the difficulties and complexities of dealing with old style currencies. Do you worry that Bitcoin will be like any other bubble and crash eventually? And if so, Will other digital currencies fill the void? Well, the, the Bitcoin uh, price has collapsed four times already. So, you know, bubbles tend to inflate once and then collapse spectacularly. They don't tend to go up in price. And when they have a setback, bounce back again just a few months later. That is not, you know, the usual behavior of a bubble. Bitcoin has already had four major crashes where it quickly recovered, uh, regaining its old uh, price and then exceeding it quite dramatically. Uh, you have to realize that Bitcoin right now at $10 billion uh, sounds like a biggish uh, tech stock, but is actually a puny, tiny little currency. And in terms of a currency, that is a very small pool of liquidity. So every time someone sneezes in the media about Bitcoin, all of that liquidity just sloshes around, and you get these price fluctuations. What we've seen is that over time, the volatility is decreasing quite dramatically as the volume increases, as more and more businesses and invest in Bitcoin, as more and more people like me who earn their income 100% in Bitcoin use it for day-to-day -day spending, uh, the price becomes more and more stable. Over time, I don't think volatility is going to be a big problem. Meantime, what people don't see in the background is hundreds and hundreds of startups uh, that have significant in innovation that are being invested in by uh, mainstream investors and that are creating thousands of jobs right now. So Bitcoin is a little island of growth and jobs and opportunity and innovation. Uh, in a sea of stagnant economic uh, conditions across Europe and across the world and across the U.S. 
uh, I think Bitcoin has tremendous potential because if you look behind the price of the currency, which can swing quite wildly, the technology itself is truly revolutionary and disruptive, and it has all of this potential for so many innovations in the financial services industry, which frankly hasn't moved far beyond 1950s technologies like credit cards. Bitcoin is being used right now by thousands of people. But is this type of currency really feasible and sustainable for the entire planet to use? I think that's an easy uh, question to answer. Bitcoin is already working globally. Uh, Bitcoin isn't the 194th national currency. It's the first transnational currency. And sitting here today, I can pull out my smartphone and pay my subcontractor in Bangalore, India, and they will receive that payment in a few seconds. I'll pay 40 cents to send it. Uh, they will have to pay nothing to receive it. It will be in their smartphone uh, Bitcoin account instantly. And uh, that kind of power can revolutionize global trade, it can revolutionize services, and most importantly, it can start affecting some of the most exploitative markets in the world, the remittances market, where every year companies like Western Union extract $74 billion from the poorest people on the planet just to send money home. And with Bitcoin, we have the opportunity of rebooting those flows of money and allowing uh, migrants, uh, immigrant workers in this country to send money home, or in other countries, of course, to send money Money home to their relatives without paying 30 percent or sometimes even 40 percent and the poorer the country the higher the fee so there are so many opportunities in the current financial environment not just for innovation but for flattening the fees that are paying for uh, risks introduced by lack of technology in the existing industry well this movement of decentralizing technology is making people rethink a lot of things about government and the way the world works how do decentralized systems fit in to the world today Decentralized systems uh, allow you to operate at large scale and achieve consensus. So it used to be, for example, that media organizations could only work if you had one large uh, national newspaper and it filtered all views until only a trickle of information reached an audience and it was carefully vetted. And we've moved past that with the internet and created opportunities for more people to have a voice because the problems of scale that centralized media solved no longer exists in a world of ubiquitous communication, so decentralized systems can, can solve those much better. Uh, similarly, I think in the world of finance, we have all of these hierarchical institutions that are trying to solve problems of scale that no longer exist. And Bitcoin is a perfect example of the ability to achieve consensus on a distributed system at massive scale without the need for a central authority. So as soon as the need for the central authority goes away, the solutions that can come out of that are truly extraordinary.